Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special episode, a special Christmas-themed episode of the Disciple Makers Podcast. Um, and we just wanted to talk briefly with everyone about how do you disciple people throughout the holidays, throughout the Christmas season, and also with New Year's coming right just around the corner, how can we be intentional people? How do we pour into people's lives throughout the busyness of this season? And while we're also trying to take care of our, our own hearts through this season and get it focused on Jesus. So Bobby, maybe you have some tips for us, um, the listeners, on, on how to disciple people throughout this season. Yeah, Dave, thank you. So uh, everyone is listening to this uh, possibly on Christmas Day, but likely after Christmas Day, uh, because that's when it's coming out. So let me just talk about more of uh, some anchors about Christmas then some perspectives coming into the new year in terms of discipling people. So I'm just going to trust that everybody's done a good job uh, in their churches, if they're church leaders, with focusing on the birth of Jesus, what Scripture teaches. The amazing thing that God would be born to uh, probably a 14-year-old girl. Uh, Jewish girls at this time were around 14 years of age when they got married. Wow. So uh, God would have been born to Mary, who had amazing faith, according to Luke 2, but she was still 14 years of age in a very poor uh, poor uh, world back then, if we can just imagine. Uh, but I hope that uh, the wonder of all that and the joy of all of that is something that you celebrated really well. And so uh, let's talk about the transition from that as we head into looking at the new year and then into the new year itself. So the transition coming out of Christmas is there's a lot of people who have been pricked about the things of Jesus. Uh, they may have been reminded of stories, the Bible stories that they knew as children. For some people, regular church attending people, of course, it would be just a, a joy sort of a normal thing, uh, just a deepening of where they're at. But I think the big thing to remember coming out of Christmas is the receptivity period. Do you know, Dave, that um, studies have been done for church leaders, and the period after you attend church, uh, for like a day or two after, but even in the week after, there's a heightened receptivity that people have. And what I'm thinking of is a heightened receptivity for people to be invited into discipling relationships. Mm. That's good. So you're just saying, like, as people are maybe people that haven't gone to church um, all year, but they're feeling festive and they want to go do something with their family, and they attend the Christmas Eve services at our churches, you're saying those few days after that, that they're just more open to maybe starting something new and being disciples. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, very much so. And then the period leading up to New Year's and the first week after New Year's Day, uh, a very high number of people set New Year's resolutions. Yeah. Now, of course, a lot of people talk about how most people who set New Year's resolutions don't complete them. They don't fulfill them. Uh, but I still think that we can actually help people with that spirit and that desire to connect with God, and especially coming out of Christmas to connect with new resolutions in the new year. Yeah. So I'd like, to, I'd like to recommend a couple of things that I'm thinking about, and I would encourage our listeners to think about as they think about discipling people in the new year. That's awesome. It's sort of like um, setting hooks, I don't know if that's what to say, it, or an anchor in people's emotions from the holidays that can sort of carry them throughout this next year. Cause really it's discipleship. The way it's really been helpful for me has been accountability. Like when I was leading um, a home group at our church, your son, Chad was in the group with me and there was an Indian family that I was teaching their, their daughter piano lessons. And I felt really strongly that I needed to start talking about Jesus with this family. And I shared that with the home group. And that next week, I taught the lesson, and I didn't do it. 
for some reason or other. It just didn't happen. I, I don't know if I wasn't like looking for the right moment. But then that following Sunday, after we did the home group questions and all that, Chad was really curious. And he said, hey, how'd it go sharing the gospel with that family? And I was like, I didn't do it. I felt, and I felt embarrassed, right? He, he was, as a friend, holding me accountable. I mean, that sounds way harsher than what it was. He was just being my friend and helping yeah. me. But that next week, I made sure that I did it because I knew Chad was going to ask me about it the next week. And it's sort of like that with uh, maybe newcomers to the church or just people that we're inviting into these relationships is we're helping them follow through on these intentions that they already have. They want yeah. this. They want to do these things. And we get to yeah. kind of come alongside them and just help them fulfill those, which is a really cool thing. So I'm looking yeah. forward to hearing your tips, Bobby. Let's dive into yeah. those. So so before we get into that, let me just mention something that you just pointed out with yourself. Uh, and this is one of the uh, key aspects of using Discovery Bible Study or what's called the three-thirds model. Uh, Discovery Bible Study will usually have a question. The question is, uh, who do you need to share what you have discovered in Scripture with? Uh, three-thirds is a little bit different, but but similar at the same time. Uh, with three-thirds, you're looking, uh, you're looking back at your week that you just had. So there's accountability there. Uh, in other words, did you say you were going to do some things and how did you do on that? Then it's looking at scripture, or you might say looking up, what does God say? And then the last third is looking out what's coming up the following week. <clears throat> and the great thing about both of these models, and there's many others, is that they they get you to do two things. Uh, somebody described it as fishing and forming. In other words, they hold us all accountable to fish for uh, people who are lost with love and good words and sharing, uh, but also forming. In other words, uh, we said we needed to obey something. How are we doing on obedience, which is forming us into the image of Jesus? So at the heart of really effective discipling groups, those two things, uh, forming and fishing should be going on with all of us. That's great. And that's extremely helpful because I know it, sometimes when we pull people into these groups, it's like, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's, I, I appreciate how the process is, it's organic, you know, like just going back to what Chad did with me, that was such a, it was just a friendly thing to do. Like he yeah. was uh, invested in my life, you know, like he knew what was going on and he remembered and was yeah. thoughtful the next week to just ask about it, right? Like yeah. that's at, at the heart of it. Those those three tips are just, you know, love people like Jesus. <laughs> that's yeah. how He does with us, you know. And that's how we need to do for them. So, well, and the other thing that comes out of it, and this is why uh, a, a a group, a discipling group that has some version of accountability, can be really helpful because we all need the intentionality of saying hey, this is something I should do. And then the commitment of this is something I'm going to do. That's good. The biggest factor in uh, reaching people who don't know Jesus is that one word, intentionality. You have to be highly intentional to reach people who don't know Jesus. So the idea of committing to it and then being accountable to it is a really great thing. In fact, Dave, let me uh, pivot from that and just talk about the three things I just want to encourage all of our listeners with during what is maybe the most receptive period of all to invite somebody into a discipling relationship. So the first thing I want to talk about is encouraging people to pray about it. And in fact, don't just pray about it. Uh, I would encourage you, if you can, to fast about it. Like, even if you're just going to skip a meal or skip two meals, but just the spiritual practice of saying, God, I do want to disciple people. It's not only what Jesus commanded, but, and Dave, I think this is the biggest motivation. I mean, I think we should do it because Jesus commanded it in Matthew 28, but I think it's one of those things where we don't even need that command when we have the love of God. Right. Because what God desires for every human being on planet Earth 
is that they would come to place their faith in Jesus, and then they would become more and more like Jesus. And if I really love somebody, I, I just want those two things for everybody I know. Right, me too. You know, we're, we're going to stand before God on, on the day of judgment at the end of our lives, and uh, we really want to love people well in light of eternity. And so I really want to love my neighbors, my family, my friends, uh, even people I don't know. I want to be a man of love who knows one day they're going to have to stand before Jesus. So I want to, to disciple them to faith in Jesus. And then everybody that I know who already has faith in Jesus, I want to be in relationship with them and them in relationship with me so we can help each other to become more and more like Jesus. So it's a it's definitely motivated by love. It's a what I often call a great commandment motivation to love God and love people for the great commission. And so that's something we should really pray and fast before we just jump in and invite somebody into a discipling relationship. That's awesome. You know, in the in the previous episode on this podcast, Chris Seidman said, before you talk to somebody about Jesus, you need to talk to Jesus about that somebody. Yeah. And that really stood out to me. And that's exactly what you're saying. We, we've got yeah. to create time and space to be deep in prayer and fasting on the behalf of these people, asking the Holy Spirit to move and, and to work on their hearts before we even mention Jesus to these people. Um, I think that that's, that's fantastic. And that's also something like I, I don't set New Year's resolutions because I feel like I'm going to, like you said, I'm going to abandon them. But I do try to set goals every year. And that's one of my goals uh, personally and also for my worship team at Harpeth is how can we be focusing on lost people and how can we use the gifts that we've been given with music to reach out? You know, like how can we be creative? And as wow. Shidanke Johnson always inspires me every time he comes to town or I'm listening to his podcast episodes, he just he, they seem so crafty. Um, with the gospel and just with their natural giftings that they've got to win people over to Jesus. And I'm like, I want to be like that. You know, that number one, that's what people need. Number two, it is it is the Great Commission. And number three, that's like an exciting way to like, partner with Jesus on that mission. So that's yeah. something that I'm looking forward to in the new year. What about you, Bobby? Like, is there is there something that's on the forefront of your mind for 2024 that you want to do differently maybe than you've done in the past? So so let me, uh, this may uh, seem counterintuitive to everybody who's listening to us, but I have a group, we call them home groups, and I have an apprentice that I'm discipling. Uh, it's worked out in my group. I've actually got two guys that are my apprentice that I'm discipling. And I feel like uh, I need to have more than this group and these two people. Of course, I try to disciple the leadership, uh, the executive uh, minister of church, and trying to make sure I keep discipling our elders. And and then uh, with, uh, I have a couple of other ministries. Um, <clears throat> but I've been praying because there's three guys that I feel like I need to invite into. We call them T groups. And you know, Dave, I keep praying about it, and I keep sensing uh, God says not yet. And so <laughs> As we head into 20, and part of that's because of me uh, already being on the border of being too busy. So it may sound strange to our listeners to be for me to be saying, it's a really receptive time. Consider inviting people into a discipling relationship. And here I am saying, I'm feeling like right now I really want to do more, but the Lord's saying, no, just hold off. Wow. So now uh, I, I guess my defense on that is, it's not like I'm not discipling people like right. I am, but I need to not be too ambitious. So let me just say to, to everybody who's listening, who isn't discipling people, uh, start by praying about it, like we're praying and, and even fasting. And I want to address, Dave, if I can, the lead ministers, the lead pastors in churches, and just say it's so vital that you do it. Uh, or if you're in a ministry like Dave, the thing that I'm so grateful about you for, you're not only a worship leader, you're a disciple maker. Right. 
And we've got to be what we want other people to be. That's right. And so I just want to encourage, if you're in a church leadership position, don't worry about what your church is doing. Uh, just worry as you head into the new year, not worry. Uh, be convicted about what God wants you to do and the receptivity of inviting people into discipling relationships uh, in this season. And that leads me to my second tip or encouragement, and that is to find a good, simple model. And, and uh, here's the description that we use of it. It needs to be simple, effective, and reproducible. When I say simple, I mean it can't be too complicated, where they got to read all these books, memorize all these scriptures. There's a place for reading books, and there's a place for memorizing scriptures, but most of our discipling relationships are not like that. So we need something that's simple, and I'm going to give you a couple of ideas. Something simple, it needs to be effective, like it really needs to help everybody who's in the group to be disciples and to make disciples, and then reproducible. Once you've been through whatever the discipling model is, you can turn around and do that with the people who are in it can turn around and do it with somebody else. Mm. So let me, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, mention three very simple models and then I'll pause Dave and you can jump in. The first one is this here. Here's a model for you. Invite people into a discipling relationship, invite uh, three to four other people, keep it to five or under uh, same gender, uh, invite them into a discipling relationship and here's something you could do that's very simple. Just say you're going to read one chapter of the Bible every day. So you invite them into the group. You want it to be simple, effective, and reproducible. Ask everybody to read one chapter of the Bible a day. And you could start January 1st uh, uh, with Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. Now, here's what we know about that. We know that you can read the whole New Testament in a year, if you read just one chapter a day, Monday through Friday. So that's a great, great thing. Hey, let's read the New Testament this year. So read one chapter a day, five minutes a day. And then there's four questions you can use. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here they are. Here, here they are. Uh, the, I call them the four H's. Let's start with the head. First one is, what stood out to you factually? From what you read. So, you, you know, this last week you did five chapters. What, what stood out to you as a truth from God's word? So it's objective. It's the head, the heart. What moved your heart when you were reading in the last five days? Like what convicted you? What like emotionally or with meaning? What is it that got to you? Number three, the, the hands. So head, heart, hands. What are you going to do because of what you read this past week? What are you going to do? This is the uh, forming, uh, uh, you know, forming in the image of Jesus. And then number four, who can you help to be a disciple of Jesus this week? So you get the the last two are the the forming hands. What are you going to do? And then uh, help. Who are you going to help? So it's head, heart, hands, and help. That's a very simple model that everybody could use right away. Uh, I can tell you other models. Like Dave, you know, we use this book called Trust and Follow Jesus. Yeah, which is available on Amazon.com. Uh, it's a reproducible model. Another model, and you can just Google this is Discovery Bible Study. Uh, you could use one of those three models. And, uh, uh, you know, the key thing is it's more about explicitly inviting people into a discipling relationship, have a simple, effective, reproducible tool, and jump right in and do it. That's good. And that reminds me of your the acronym that I've learned through discipleship.org, KISS. Is, yeah. that, is that through D.org, the keep it simple, stupid? No, no, I think, I think that <laughs> pre-existed a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I love that acronym, but that's exactly what you're saying. And also, you know, you're talking about getting plugged into Scripture. That is like the way for somebody to be growing in spiritual maturity. Yeah. It's just being in the Word 
you know, at least five, like you said, five days a week, you could finish the whole New Testament. That's that's what our whole church is wrapping up right now. We're all in Revelation yeah. together because we've been doing that this year. Yeah. And I know personally, just looking at people on my team that have been in the Word this year, they have all matured so much spiritually and have just grown in the Lord and have grown yeah. in confidence um, in the spirit. It's just an amazing thing. And, and that's a result of discipleship and just being in the word. So that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then my third, uh, my third tip as we head into the new year. Uh, so the first one again is uh, pray about it, maybe fast and pray, invite somebody, invite three to four people into a, a group with you. Uh, make sure if you're in church leadership that you're doing that, get a simple, effective, reproducible model and then number three, when you start your group, talk about multiplying it. That's good. Right up front, right up front. Here's what we've learned about groups that effectively multiply is that you have to tell people up front, hey, we're going to meet. I would recommend you meet for a year. So you're going to meet for a year in 2024, go through the New Testament in one of the ideas we have shared. But you tell everybody up front, after we do this together, we're going to multiply. So half of us are going to stay together and invite some other people in 2025. And then the other half will go start another group and invite some new people to join them. That way you have the continuity of some relationships will go on for at least another year, but you're also multiplying the mission so you can uh, see that more people are discipled. So here's how that tip works, Dave. You've got to tell everybody up front when you start your group and be really clear about it and get everybody's buy-in that we're going to multiply after a year. Then, say if you're going to do it at the end of 2024, about a third uh, of the time before you're about to multiply, as the leader, you got to remind everybody. you got to say, hey, remember, we all committed. We're going to multiply. And then as you get about a month out, then you come back to it. And if you are really clear up front, you're clear again during the journey, uh, and then you're clear for about a month before you multiply, uh, people will do that. But if you don't have that kind of intentionality and it's a good group, people don't want to multiply. It's kind of like they want to stay together. Right. But you got to remind them of the mission that God wants everybody to place their faith in Jesus and then become more and more like Jesus. And it's the most loving thing you can ever do for somebody is to help them be about what God wants them to be about. That's right. In those two ways. That's exactly right. That was great, Bobby. Thank you so much for, for spilling that out for us and giving us those tips and just being real with us about what God's doing in your life and where he's leading you in 2024. That that was encouraging for me to hear. So thank you so much for taking the uh, time to do this pleasure. today. Love um, you, Dave. Love you too, Bobby. And I just, you know, I hope I wish this to you and also to the, everybody listening, just that you'd have a Merry Christmas um, with you and your family and a happy new year. And that just yes, as we're too. in this season, no matter where everybody's at, that we would all be able to just rest and the hope and peace that we have in Jesus. And um, I wish that upon you and upon the listeners as well. So, Dave, I wish that upon you as well. And let me just say one word to our listeners that in 2024, we're going to focus on disciple-making culture at discipleship.org. And I'm so excited about it. I believe it's the most important conversation for disciple-making in a local church or in a ministry. How can you create a culture uh, where everybody sees uh, that we're we're just about being disciples and making disciples. That's the culture of our ministry or the culture of our church. So we'll be talking about that in 2024. Looking forward to it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you for being a listener of the Disciple Makers podcast. May God bless you and your family. And Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you. Amen.